Uh, so this session is from uh, is co-sponsored by the CEO Task Force on Electronic Resource and Metadata Best Practice, and also the Committee on uh, Technical Processing, and especially uh, the University of Toronto Libraries. So we feel very grateful for them to set up the, you know every support for this workshop and many other activities too. So uh, for today's uh, workshop, we have two renowned uh, speakers for our uh, event. First, uh, Steve uh, Shadow from uh, University of Washington Libraries uh, will give a talk on open URL. And then uh, Oliver Pesch from EBSCO, uh, from EBSCO Research Service, I will give another talk on counter and sushi. So the ERM task force uh, has a lot of agendas for this year, and we have members from all different uh, fields in East Asian librarianship and also as well as all over the world. So we encourage, uh, if you are interested, please just contact um, contact Xiu Ying or contact Bi Hua, or go to the website and then find out more information there. So first, without further ado, I will have Charlene to introduce Steve, and then during the break, uh, we will introduce Oliver, okay? It's my privilege to introduce my colleague Steve Shadow, and Steve's primary responsibility at University of Washington Library is to manage the library linking systems that I provide, sorry, the page jump, <laughs> to provide um, access to the journal full text. In addition, he catalogs e-serials selected and licensed by UW libraries. Steve's background in serial standards began with his work as an ISSN catalog at, you know, at the Library of Congress, and currently includes serving on the NISO Standing Committee for present, present, sorry, presentation and identification of electronic journals, PiJ. Steve is an accomplished cataloging trainer and gives regular presentations on library cataloging and metadata, and the role library system play in providing access to content. Let's welcome Steve. Thank you, just a second. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what I'm here today to talk with you about is the fact that you may be providing access to the CJK materials that you license that you may not even be aware of. So. Um, I know that many, a number of East Asia libraries, including our own, uh, many of the staff in those libraries pretty much think of themselves as the gateway for the resources that they license and provide access to. Um, that may not necessarily be the case. You may not be the only gateway for people to access that content. So there are alternatives that I'm going to talk about now that users may already be using that you may actually not be aware of, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how they work and some things that you can do to make them work better. So my purpose here today is to provide you with an overview of how OpenURL, together with provider, uh, vendor provided metadata, provides access to online resources through library discovery systems or through a &I databases or even such a, such a system like Google Scholar. And I'll provide some examples, some CJK examples, that show that this is actually a viable access method. So OpenURL is a standardized format for encoding a description of a resource within a uniform resource locator, intended to help users to find a copy of the resource that they are allowed to access. So let's take this apart. First of all, an open URL is a URL. It has an HTTP, it's got a domain, and it's got other elements in it. So an open URL is a URL. It is a URL that represents a citation, okay? And we'll take a look at that when we, uh, when we look at some examples of open URL. And the purpose of it is to get the user to either a copy of a resource to full text or to some other related resource or service that will be useful for them, okay? So it's a URL, it basically describes a citation or a resource, and, it's, and the purpose of it is to provide access. 
Okay, here's an example of a citation from Foreign Literature Studies, um, an article from a 2013 edition. There is an open URL that can be associated with this citation. This is, that, this is a URL. This is an open URL for this citation. Now, this, I work with these on a daily basis. I tell the staff at the University of Washington that they don't want my job. I don't want their job. <laughs> And in fact, because I have to parse these on a regular basis. Now, when you actually reformat this URL, it begins to make a little more sense. And let me grab the other mic, and we'll walk through the citation. Okay, so what's... Is this on? Oh, there we go. Okay, takes a minute to warm up. Okay, so what this is, is if you look at this, the first part of the URL, this very first line up here, is a domain that says resolver.live.washington.edu. So that is the resolver service. And we'll talk more about that in a second. You don't need to worry about that now. But what you should look at are all of these other fields that say article title, author last name, date, ending page, genre, ISSN, issue, journal title, all that. That's all citation information. So together, this URL represents a specific citation. Not only does it represent that citation that, we, that you see up at the top, but it also tells you where this citation is coming from. So if you look at the very last element here, which is the refer ID, this citation, this open URL, was created in Web of Science. Okay? So if you have enabled your your ANI databases to be open URL compliant. What that means is someone on the system side has, um, has set a configuration within Web of Science to create those little check for full text links or check at UC or check at whatever, check at your local library link for full text. When the user clicks on that link in Web of Science, it sends this URL, okay? So this is the URL that's created from, by Web of Science to help get the user to the full text. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what an open URL link resolver is. A link resolver is a service that takes a citation formatted as an open URL, you just saw one, and provides the user with library services related to that citation. These library services, the primary library service is directing the user to the full text. Okay. How many people, let me, oh, actually I'll get to that in a second, never mind. One of the other, some other services that that link can offer if you don't actually have the full text licensed, some other services that can be offered are you can request the resource. Maybe you hold it in print and that button and you'll get to a place, it'll send the user to a place where they can request a resource. Or it may, um, or the service may present an interlibrary loan form um, that the user could then request that article with all of the information from the citation filled into the form, the interlibrary loan form. Okay? Or it could search, you know, start up a search of your library catalog or it could find related resources. Okay, all of this is done with the open URL and the link resolver is basically software on your discovery, your library discovery system side that will go ahead and figure this out and process it, okay? So, one of the pieces that's necessary in order to support <coughs> um, this type of linking is a knowledge base. So a knowledge base is basically a database containing information about electronic resources, such as e-journals or e-books, and their availability and accessibility. So using, and you can, think of, you can think of a knowledge base as just a big old spreadsheet that lists all of the titles that you have licensed online or that, are, that you know about that are available online, open access, with the title, the ISSN or the ISBN, if it's a journal with the dates of coverage and with links, linking information. Okay, so that's basically a knowledge base. It's just a big old spreadsheet of all your electronic resources. Okay, so using that knowledge base a link resolver can determine if an item is available electronically and can identify the appropriate copy for a user. 
So at the University of Washington, our knowledge base is within the Alma Community Zone, which I won't go into detail about that, but basically the, our knowledge base is a centralized collection of online resource mark records contributed by publishers, content providers, vendors, and libraries, including concerts. So for most of our serial records, it's either a full-level concert record or it's just some kind of a brief record that has been created by the vendor that's included. And this is where we start getting into that idea of vendor-supplied metadata. Okay. Vendors and publishers will provide metadata to like Ex Libris, to discovery system providers and vendors, and then they incorporate that data into, the, into your library's knowledge base. Okay, so just in the case of our community zone, which contains uh, just over three million records altogether, um, mostly e-journals, e-books, and some other things. Uh, 68, over 68,000 of those are for Chinese language resources, 51,000 are for Japanese language resources, and 17,000 are for Korean language resources. So you can see that there are quite a few East Asian resources that are profiled through our central knowledge base. Okay? The East Asia Library has had very little to do with this other than identifying packages that we need to turn on in order to get them into the knowledge base. You know, so I assume that for many of you, you're, you at your institutions are in similar situations. Okay. This kind of profiling may be happening without you necessarily being aware of it. Um, and the record fullness and quality in this metadata, in these records, can vary greatly. So we're going to do an example of, we're gonna sh I'm going to show you how open URL linking works. Basically, if a researcher starts in Google Scholar, if you've implemented Google Scholar or profiled your settings to include the My Library feature, that'll put library links for your library into Google Scholar. Okay. You could say the same thing about any database, any EBSCOhost database, ProQuest database, any ANI traditional kind of database can also implement these links as well. So the user sees a citation that they're interested in. They see that there is a uh, check for full text at UW link, which is the library link, which is just on the right-hand side of that display. They click on that link. What that link does is it, that link sends an open URL to our resolver. Okay, so our resolver is the software that's used to create links to the full text, to check to check for holdings and create links to the full text. Okay, this is part of the system that you get from a vendor. Okay. So it sends an open URL to the resolver. The resolver then goes and takes, and you can see in the open URL you've got a date, 1986, an ISSN, and there's also a PMID in there as well, a PubMed ID. Okay, the, so the resolver takes those identification elements, it checks against the knowledge base, if you think of the knowledge base as a big old spreadsheet, it just checks against that, it sees, oh, there's an entry in the knowledge base that has the same ISSN, that has the dates within 1986. You know, so, oh, it looks like we would have, we do have access to this citation, because we have a journal that has the right coverage dates. Okay, so then the resolver comes back, and this is all behind the scenes, user doesn't see any of this. The resolver then takes that information, and the other piece of information in the link resolution is how to create a full text link for any particular source. So then the resolver takes that information, it takes the citation information, it forms a URL, and it redirects the session after the user's clicked on the link in Google Scholar, it then redirects the session to the full text of the article. Okay. This is when everything is working correctly. Okay. It doesn't always work correctly, and that's why I have a job. <laughs> but that's the idea behind open URL link resolution. Because a link resolver basically parses the citation elements from the source open URL. It tests those uh, elements against the library's knowledge base. It identifies targets, typically full text targets, 
based on the test results, and then it creates and offers links based on linking knowledge log, based on linking log logic that is in the resolver. Okay, is that all clear? I know this is really fast, but does that all make sense? Okay, great. Okay, why do libraries use link resolvers? Come on, there we go. Because navigating library systems is time consuming, especially when you think of the traditional library catalog that doesn't contain articles, it basically contains journal titles and books and videos and the things that are traditionally held in a library catalog. So here we have that same citation from Foreign Literature Studies from 2013. We looked at the open URL earlier. If the user were in a traditional library catalog, what they would have to do is they would have to take the citation without open URL. They take the citation, they go, okay, I have to look up foreign literature, I have to see whether we have online access to foreign literature studies. If they go to the library catalog, they have to do a search, they, and this particular user is doing a search for foreign literature studies. And of course, given those generic words, foreign literature studies, that can result in a lot of hits that, that aren't the journal that they're looking for. So then if the user even refines it to something like if they use quotes or something, they might get something that's a little more, um, oh yeah, because here the, the first search, I know you can't see this very well, but the first search, they still aren't looking, finding the journal that they, that they want. There's a journal limit, so they've limited They've limited their search to journals. And then after they do that, then they get two hits. And this is obviously the journal that they're looking for that's actually a, I think it's in Chinese, yeah. It's actually a Chinese journal. Foreign L Literature Studies is the English title of this Chinese journal. Okay. But the user now is here, so then they have to click on the online version record, and then they get to the bibliographic record for the journal, then they see that there are two links down here. They have to figure out which link to click on depending on the coverage. Now they have to go back and refer back to the citation and go, oh, 2013, which one of these is 2013? Oh, it's the second one. Okay, I have to click on that one. Now they go to the journal homepage Okay, so they're nowhere near the article yet. They're just incrementally getting closer to that article. You know, now they're at the journal homepage. They have to identify the, t the link to the 2013 issues. Okay, they click that. Then they have to identify, then they have to go back and say, oh, wait a minute, which issue was it in 2013? Oh, it was number, issue number two. Okay, so I click on the number two. Now I get to a table of contents. Okay, that's fine, but now, okay, so nine, page 92, where, oh, it's all in Chinese, but the citation's in English. Where in the heck am I going? Okay, oh, 92, it must be that one down there. Okay, it's that link down there. Oh, now I'm finally to the article page, but I'm still not to the full text yet. <laughs> you know, the full text is still one more click away. So, instead of the user going directly from a source like Google Scholar or Web of Science and going directly to, to the full text, if you rely on the library catalog, there's eight clicks and navigation that really an expert needs to have in order to get down to the full text. So that's one reason to use open URL link resolvers. An open URL link resolver will get the user to an, the appropriate copy. For this particular case, we have a 2016 citation from Journal of Chinese Cinemas. The user, in this case it might be a faculty person who knows that the Journal of Chinese Cinemas is published by Taylor and Francis they may go directly to the Taylor, Taylor and Francis page and see that they have to log in and they have to pay money to get the article. But in reality, hello. But in reality, so they, there's the pay. Uh, what is it, 60, no, $160 for three months worth of access to this issue. But in reality, they don't have to do that because the journal is available from one of their subscribed EBSCO databases. Okay, and we know that in the knowledge base. The knowledge base tells us we subscribe to this journal from EBSCO. So if you're using a link resolver, you send the user over to the one, to the version that the library actually subscribes to. The last reason to use a link resolver is it provides alternative services if full text is not licensed. 
So here's a 2016 article from the International Economic Journal. When you go to the International Economic Journal, the citation, you'll see that there's an embargo period. So the embargo period in EBSCO is, I think, the last 18 months. Yeah, oh no, it says full text with an 18-month with an embargo, yeah. So the 2016 is, issues are not going to be available full text from EBSCO. So we don't want to send the user there. Instead, we send the user to an interlibrary loan request form, or we put up an option for them to be able to request it through interlibrary loan, because we don't appear to have the access to the journal either online or in print. Okay, so that's the other reason to use an open URL link resolver, is it provides alternative services if we can't serve up the online. So, now let's talk about this in the context of a library discovery service. How many of you are at an institution that has a discovery service like Primo, WorldCat Local, WorldCat Discovery, Summon, any of those? How many work at a place like that? Okay, most of you. Um, so discovery service, let's talk for a couple minutes about what a discovery service is. A discovery service is basically an interface to pre-indexed metadata and their full text documents made available by a library. Okay, so it's a bunch. If you think about a discovery service as basically a big old bucket that has citations from EBSCO from ProQuest, it has all your library mark records in it, it has citations from open access sources, it has a whole bunch of repositories deposited in there. It just is a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of metadata in a service, in a discovery service. It includes both physical and online resources. It includes article and book chapter citations. Uh, those typically come from a repository that's maintained by your vendor. Um, and that the purpose of the discovery service, it supports, it, does support, it supports discovery, you know, because users go in and they see, they try to find articles, they try to find books, you know, but it also supports fulfillment, which is basically full text linking and requesting. So, uh, Primo Central, because we're an ex libris library, Primo Central is our discovery service. Um, and actually, Primo Central is that central depository that Ex Libris maintains. And every discovery service provider has their own um, centralized repository of, um, of article and book uh, uh, metadata. So Primo Central is a collection of hundreds of millions of records harvested from primary and secondary publishers and aggregators, mostly scholarly material. Uh, primarily articles and ebooks, but it can also include conference proceedings, newspaper articles, and a bunch of stuff. A lot of streaming media, actually. If you have streaming media collections, those are also oftentimes profiled in centralized, in these centralized repositories. Many of the records include sub abstracts. Some will also include the full text that you can link to directly. So I just want to provide a couple examples uh, with, from, from our discovery system of some East Asian examples. So here's a set of records that are, um, that are made available from JSTAGE. So JSTAGE has uh, worked out an arrangement with Ex Libris, and they do this with, like I said, with all discovery providers, that they syndicate the metadata for their individual citations and make it available for these um, vendors to harvest. So these are a bunch of citations from JSTAGE. These are, and these are a number of citations from the Korea Research Memory uh, Service, okay? And again, I do apologize the fact that you can't really see those clearly. So let's talk a little bit about some open access collections that are uh, East Asian that are available, that should be available to you. Um, there are a number of services uh, located in East Asia that provide open access to their collections, and they also distribute their syndicated metadata, their citations, to discovery services so that you can include these in your discovery service. You may not even be aware that these are available for you to include in your discovery service, but if you're interested, or if you use any of these collections on a regular basis, 
you actually might have them included in your discovery service so that they're available to everyone who's using, who's using your main service, you know, your main search service, rather than just people in the know in the East Asia library. Okay? So, and I won't read the list here. Um, you, can, you can read the list yourself, but you know, it is a mix of, of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean titles. The, and the URL that I provided at the bottom, and again, this is specific to all of the discovery services do this. I'm only using Ex Libris as an example because it's the one we work with. Um, they actually have a list of the several hundred database collections that they get data for. These are the non-open access collections. Uh, that are East Asian that you can also have citations for brought into your database. Um, and there's many more of them, but these are the kinds of things that you don't want to profile this and include these citations unless you actually purchase the collection. If you purchase the collection, then it's really useful to have everything from that purchased collection in your main search, your library's main search service, okay? So what can you do as an East Asian librarian at your institution to help with discovery? First of all, for whatever system you're working with, get a list of the centrally indexed collections that have the possibility to have the citations included in your central system. Identify the collections that you want in your central search system, your discovery system, and work with your staff to get them included. It's basically some profiling by a library system staff person that will get those citations into your discovery system. And learn a little more about how your discovery, uh, how your uh, b -b 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 metadata for your discovery system actually works, it's organized. Um, on the knowledge base side, so that's if you wanna help with discovery systems. On the knowledge base side, if you haven't done this yet, work with your centralized local acquisition system staff and system staff to make sure that your online collections are profiled in your local ERM. That'll go uh, ERM, uh, Electronic Resource Management System. <laughs> I'm sorry, I used an acronym and I saw an immediate look and it was like, nope, explain the acronym. <laughs> um, that will go a long way towards getting, um, getting things into your, uh, getting these kind of citations into your, uh, into your centralized discovery system and also making sure that the full text linking works within your discovery system. And if a collection is not represented in your knowledge base, in the centralized knowledge base, you can ask your vendor to get the data. They can contact the vendor, the publisher, the provider of that collection. They can contact them and ask them for this indicated metadata. So have your acquisition staff do that. Or you can do it yourself. You can contact the vendor directly and say, we know you know, that we're using this system. We need to have you guys, if it's possible, send citation information to Ex Libris or to make it available for them to harvest. One of the things that you can tell them is they need to get a KBART file. KBART stands for Knowledge Bases and Related Tools. KBART is essentially a set of guidelines that support the data exchange between content providers and knowledge base developers. Okay, so it's basically in some respects, it's essentially like I said before, it's essentially that title list that contains identifiers, coverage, and access data. There, is, there are great documents. If you just Google KBART, you'll be able to find the documents that show how they should be formatted, what data is included. If you have vendors, if you have vendors or providers or publishers that you want their citations in your discovery system, tell them about KBART and basically say, look at everyone else is on the playground, why aren't you? You know, because one of the things that I always like to do is I like to, sh I, I'm into shaming. Um, <laughs> so if I have a vendor who's not providing citation metadata, um, I, a couple times I've actually said, look at this collection, we have, look at, we have citations from Japan Knowledge. We have, you know, three million citations from Japan Knowledge in our discovery system, and they're getting a lot of use, and we're getting more use out of the collection. We're more likely to buy them in the future. You know, so we'd like to get the same use out of your collection. And the one way to do that is for you guys to provide citation metadata using this format to our knowledge base provider. So that's why I would encourage, and also the other thing that I would mention to publishers in addition to KBART 
is to make sure that they get ISBN, ISSN, or DOIs for everything that they put out. If they publish journals, get if they publish journals, tell them about the ISSN and get them an ISSN. Have them, they're the only ones who can actually, in some countries, they're the only, the publisher is the only one who can actually apply for an ISSN. ISSN are free. They just have to apply at the National Center. Um, I've heard stories that I will, if anyone has a question about certain ISSN centers in the East Asian region, that I will be happy to talk with you privately about. If you, if you try to get publishers to do that and they get resistance. And like I said, I would encourage publishers and vendors to syndicate their metadata to knowledge base and discovery system providers. So in summary, libraries use more than just MARC records in a library catalog to provide access to full text, okay? Through the use of discovery systems, through the use of open URL, you're providing access to full text in places you may not even be aware of. Metadata created by content providers is distributed to these various systems, not just to libraries. They go to knowledge base providers and discovery systems as well. And any source, Google Scholar, EBSCO, ProQuest, um, those are the three that always pop out to me, that support open URL can potentially provide access to full text. As long as the metadata with the identifiers are in place to support the knowledge base lookup. That's the most important piece. Okay, so my final word. Library catalogers can't do it all. We never have been able to, and in fact, I can tell you the story. Barbara Tillett did this, she wrote an article early on in her career about um, how, one of the things she touches on is the split between the library catalog and abstracting and indexing databases. Because all of us of a certain age have grown up with that split, that you go one place to look for articles, you go another place to look for books, okay? The reason for that, that, that happened in 1876. The first meeting of the American Library Association, um, there, was a pro, there was a pilot project to try to include article citations in the library catalog, the card catalogs of 1876. Okay, I don't remember who, a, lar a couple large academic libraries at the time were involved. So basically the journal publishers who were part of the pilot, in the back of each issue, they had little cutout card catalog, catalog cards that had the citation for each article in that, in that issue of the journal. So the libraries were supposed to cut them out and file them in their library catalog along with their books, okay? The pilot was a dismal failure uh, just because libraries couldn't keep up with it. One of the people who was involved in that pilot was Bowker. And that was the beginning of the Bowker a &I services, you know, and now the Bowker databases. Okay, so now with discovery systems we, and these centralized repositories of citations, we have the possibility of putting that all together again in one place and allowing the, the, the searcher to be able to just search in one place and then send them from that search, send them to the place that's most appropriate, okay? Library catalogers have never been able to do it all and they still can't. We have to rely on publisher metadata to do a lot of this. So that's what you gotta, so now go out, talk to your vendors, <laughs> talk to your suppliers, and talk to your system staff and to see whether there's a possibility that you can get more of the stuff that's important to you reflected in the overall library system that you use. Any questions? Yeah. That's fine, because the thing is that the user then at least knows about the resource. Okay, so the question was, well, what happens if we have citations that don't have full text? Um, that's fine. What it'll do is, a good discovery system on the fulfillment side, they will have a, a fallback so that, it's like if they, don't, if they don't locate a publication in the knowledge base, then they'll put up an ILL form and then the user can request, re request a publication through ILL. So a lot of it depends upon your institutional policies as to whether you want to permit that level of ILL or not. You know, but it at least, at least the user finds out about the citation, finds out about the resource 
that they might not otherwise if they don't even see a citation. Any other questions? Yeah, Rob. No, 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 no. What I'm doing typically on the, the stuff that the, the, the so someone asked what I do. Yeah, that, that's what they want to know. That's <laughs> that's what Joe and, and Denise want to know is what I do in my job. Um, no, 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 no. That's fine. No, I don't know. What I'll when I'm troubleshooting when full text linking doesn't work, I go back and I look at the generated open URL and look at the elements and go, okay, where is the, what, what ISSN is being sent, what data is being sent, is there bad data here, is there, I mean, that's the kind of thing that I'm doing. No, I'm not creating those at all. Any other questions? One more, and I think we're out of, yeah. Right, right. Right. And I, I thought, why is that not being up in our discovery system? Yeah. I can tell you, there, in terms of selecting collections, and this is outside of what I do completely, so, um, but I know that that ease of access and the user interface is one criteria that is used at our shop in terms of, of um, identifying what to select and what not to select, among, among a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think open URL compliance is necessarily one of those things, especially for collections that non North American collections. You know, um, they don't know that you have to educate a lot of those those vendors. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I uh, hope you learned something. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, Oliver actually, uh, because of the flight cancellation due to weather, he wouldn't be able to come here. So yeah, although he was on the airport yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So we will do this remotely and through uh, Skype. Okay. So before we do that, let me give you a brief introduction to Oliver. So Oliver Pesch is the chief strategist for EBSCO Information Service, and in that role, he helps direct a uh, set the direction for EBSCO's resource management and access uh, service. And he wears a lot of hats. Among them is a co-chair. He's a, currently the co-chair of NISO Sushi Standing Committee, and he's a chair of Counter Board of Directors. And also, he serves on both the Counter Executive Committee and Technical Advisory Groups. And then he chairs the Counter Release 5 Technical Working Group. So I think it's uh, really, we, we are very happy and lucky to have Oliver uh, to talk for us today about counter and sushi and introduction and application. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, so I get all yeah, our, our, our <laughs> University of Toronto <laughs> colleague will set up the connection. Can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> all right, and can everybody hear me all right? 
Okay, so is there anything else you're doing on that end, that end or shall I get started? Um, please get started. All of those <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, well, I fully intended to be there um, for the meeting today, but uh, American Airlines had different plans as the uh, sort of weather rolled through. And uh, <clears throat> so very thankful for the folks at the University of Toronto um, conference or meeting facilities folks who set up this WebEx because it, uh, um, much appreciated. Um, so today's talk, I was asked to talk to you about the uh, counter code of practice, sushi, provide an introduction and, and, and some applications to it. And so a quick Oops, I missed my screen here. Yeah, here we go. It's a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So we're, going to, we're, we're going to start with a brief history of counter and sushi to serve as kind of an introduction to these standards, as well as provide a context for the balance of the session. Then we'll look at some of the counter release four reports, uh, the current release, and paying particular attention to you know the reports and the metrics that are most frequently being used. And we'll talk briefly about what it means for a vendor to be counter compliant. Um, look at Sushi in more detail about the automatic harvesting of usage statistics. And then look ahead to uh, the new release five, there's a new release in the works. And then hopefully there'll be time for discussions and questions at the end. So starting with a brief history, of uh, counter and sushi. The counter code of practice came about as a result of a collaboration between publishers, librarians, and vendors like aggregators and so forth. And the goal was to provide librarians with consistent, credible, and uh, comparable usage statistics for collection evaluation and other things. And so if we look at this timeline, um, as we go through it, and I'm going to get a pointer here. So 2002 is when the counter was launched as an initiative, and 2003 was when the first code of practice came about. And that was focused on journals and databases. And the success of counter exposed some scalability problems. Um, <clears throat> the, the notion of collecting, or the problem is collecting multiple reports from dozens of providers, it's, it creates a lot of work. And around 2004 is when ERM systems came about and they were looking to automate uh, usage reporting. So they wanted to automate um, counter statistics, um, but there was a lot of problems in just gathering the data. So SUSHI, which is the Standardized Usage Statistics Harvesting Initiative, uh, was launched in, in 2004 to help address this issue. And, um, a draft was released in 2006, and, and the first official standard was released in 2007. Um, and it hasn't really changed that much since then, honestly. Um, Counters had several releases over time. And um, <clears throat> 2013 is when release four came about, and that's the one that's in use today, and that combines both the, the uh, books and databases, books um, code of practice and the journals and database code of practice. Uh, another point to note on this is in 2015, Counter helped create the USIS website. So if you're interested in usage statistics, um, I'd recommend you look at it. It's USIS um uk.org i believe um and um a lot of information on using usage statistics a lot of information is placed on on counter reports if you've run into problems with 
counter vendors or counter reports. Um, you can provide feedback. It gets investigated. It's a pretty cool site. So anyway, that's the quick timeline. Um, and digging a little more into, into Sushi. Sushi was developed, um, and it's really about enabling the automatic harvesting of counter usage statistics. And that was its primary goal. But a secondary goal was to address inconsistencies that were seen in the Excel version or the spreadsheet version of the reports. And that was, the goal was to introduce, and actually we introduced um, a formal XML schema to describe counter usage. And that schema then allows the reports to be automatically validated and, um, and, and helped eliminate some of these format issues between reports. Inconsistencies are really not that severe if you're reading a spreadsheet as a human because your eyes adapt for, for differences. But if you've got an ERM trying to load a report and uh, the labels are named differently, even though they're slight, uh, it's very problematic. So that was why that was why sushi uh, was brought about. So this graphic is an attempt to show how sushi works. On the left hand side, we've got an institution that may have an ERM system or usage consolidation system. And on the right hand side, we have a content provider who is uh, <clears throat> uh, providing its usage statistics via Sushi. So assuming the ERM has been configured to support Sushi, um, and here's what might happen on a schedule basis. So let's say you set your, your usage up to be harvested on the 15th of the month. Well, on the 15th of the month for a given provider, the ERM will then send a message to the Sushi client, which then sends the request over to the Sushi server, which then retrieves the usage statistics for the institution, um, formats it as an XML message, sends it back to the Sushi client, which then extracts the usage data from the, um, from the response and deposits it in, in some sort of a usage reporting service that the ERM has. And so all of this happens automatically, and it happens in a matter of few, a few seconds. So you can see how um, if you get this set up for you know, the dozens or more uh, content providers, how this um, is a great time saver. So a couple quick facts about Sushi. Um, firstly, Sushi is a requirement for counter compliance. So if you have a counter vendor, a library vendor, publisher rather, a vendor saying, uh, yeah, we offer counter reports, but we're not offering Sushi, then they are not counter compliant. And you would take that issue up with counter themselves and they will, they will deal with it. It's supported by um, currently more than 120 content site platforms. Um, I, I got those numbers from EBSCO's usage consolidation system. Um, which means we're covering tens of thousands of e-journals and millions of e-books. Compatibility and quality were a question about Sushi in the early days. And it turns out this, it was not so much Sushi itself, but the implementations of Sushi. And that has improved dramatically over the last couple of years. And this, the, the graphic on the right is, uh, again, representing EBSCO's uh, usage consolidation service. And of the thousands of reports that are harvested each month, the success rate is 95%. And it's actually exceeding that now. And the ones that are not successful, a lot of those are because of configuration issues, like wrong um, customer IDs were used or that sort of thing, and not actual fault of Sushi itself. So things um, have improved greatly in the last uh, two to three years and continue to improve. All right, so let's take a look at the current code of practice, which is release four. And I've got some dates here. It started in 2013, and um, it'll probably be with us until 2020. Um, and there will be an overlap for about at least a year between release four and release five to allow um, 
uh, systems to catch up and adapt and, and so forth. So anyways, here's the list of standard reports. Uh, and these are the reports that a content provider must supply if they are applicable. So if you deliver books from your platform, you have to provide book reports. If you have ANI or full text databases, you have to have database reports, journal content, journal reports, et cetera. Um, so I won't go into them all here, but there's a few that are going to be used a lot and are used a lot. And, and these are journal report one, and we'll go into these in a little more detail, book reports one and two, database report one, and, and the platform report one. So journal report one um, <clears throat> is the number of successful full text requests by month in journal. And so what's being counted? Well, these are the metric types that will show. Full text requests, it's really the main statistic. That is the, the one that's sort of in the body of the report, sort of over here on the, on the, on the right. And these counts increment any time a user clicks a link to view or download the actual article, regardless of format. It doesn't matter whether it's PDF or HTML. Uh, the PDF and HTML are actually broken out separately um, in the report, and that helps um, provide some insight into the user interface. Um, in some cases, a publisher always shows the HTML when the user uh, clicks an article link from an open URL resolver, for example, and um, then the user can subsequently click on the PDF. So in that case, it would actually be two full text requests because the same article was retrieved uh, once as HTML automatically and again as PDF on the user request. So knowing those numbers kind of helps provide some context to how the user interface works. The full text request one is the typical one that is going to be used on, uh, on your um, uh, analysis for uh, cost per use and that sort of thing. So the other thing is the scope of what's being counted. So it's really all usage for the journal on the platform. So if you are looking at ProQuest or, or EBSCOhost um, and a journal is in multiple databases, this is counting the usage of the journal across all databases on that platform. Um, it's also counting the content regardless of whether that content was available as gold open access or you know because of, of the subscription. So it's really it's about totals. A couple key things and I think um, uh, Steve kind of hi highlighted some of these in his 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 uh, talk as well. Identifiers are are are, are critical. Uh, because usage data is just one piece of the analysis when you're doing analysis. You may have entitlement lists or holdings lists, KBART format, for example. Um, you might have cost data from acquisitions. You might have other data that you're trying to fold in to create an analysis. So to help with that, um, the uh, counter reports include a DOI a journal uh, which hopefully appears on the KBART report, um, proprietary identifiers, so um, Elsevier, Springer, virtually all publishers have their own identifier for a journal, and if that can appear on the invoice as well as on the usage, you can then connect the two together. And then there is the standard print and online ISSNs. And so how you might use this data, of course, is most obvious one is cost per use, which is the however much you pay for the journal and divided by the uh, full text requests. You could also do package analysis. So if you can get a list of journals um, that are part of a publisher package and then merge in the, uh, the usage data, then you can take the overall usage of the package and calculate the package level cost per use with the total usage for all the titles in the package. 
And that can be helpful if you're managing um, drops and swaps, as they call it, in, 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 in package orders. So uh, knowing which titles are being used and which are not being used is important. So moving on to book reports one and two, they look very much the same. Book report one is the number of successful titles requests by month and title. And book report two is the number of successful section requests by month and title. So what's being counted? Well, in both cases, it's full text requests. And these are the key, the key metrics. But the difference is book report one, um, that is provided when the entire book is delivered as a single PDF. That usage is reported in book report one. Book report two is when the book is delivered in chunks. It could be articles, it could be chapters, it could be other sections. Um, and that's counted in book report two. So as you can imagine, um, if a user looked at two books, book report one, that count could be two. Book report two, if each book was 10 chapters and they looked at all chapters, that count would be 20. So certain level of imbalance between these two reports. Again, identifiers. Uh, identifiers are also included in these reports to help um, provide the match points for, for merging in additional data. It also has the print and online ISSN, and those would appear if the book is part of a monographic series. So again, you could use this data for general usage tracking, but also cost per use. But the point to remember is the numbers you get using book report two versus book report one will be very different and possibly an order of magnitude different, making it impossible to compare um, two book platforms if they deliver the books in different sized pieces. So let's move on to database reports. Database report one, that's searches, result clicks, and record views by month and database. Um, this is really about both full text databases that you might find on Scohost or ProQuest, as well as abstract and indexing databases such as PsycInfo and Sociindex and ERIC and, and the like. A lot of things are being counted. Um, Searches are counted as regular searches, and that is when a user selected the database specifically to do the search. So the user wanted to search that database. Searches federated and automated is when the system decided what databases to search. As many know, in federated searches and discovery services, um, the system will basically uh, broadcast the search to as many sources as possible um, and then bring back the results and then use relevancy ranking to try to, 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 to bring the most relevant ones to the top. So the fact that a database was searched under a federated search does not really provide you any indication of value. The other two metric types are result clicks and record views. The record views is like when you look at an abstract or detailed record, but the result click is sort of any click on a result on a result list. So if I click the open URL link, you know, the go click, click the find full text. If I go look at the full text, if I go look at the abstract view, if I click on citations or whatever, those all count as result clicks. And really the one that's probably most meaningful to compare one database to the next from one year to the next is result clicks. All right, so let's look at the platform report, um, and that is searches, result clicks, and record views by month and platform. Um, again, it's the overall statistics for the platform. Um, it's counting regular searches, which is the searches that were conducted 
by a user who is, is on that platform's interface typically, um, as well as federated automated searches, which are what that platform may have been involved with through a broadcast search, and total result clicks and total record views. The search is regular is probably the one that gets most used to put in surveys and things because that is really, you know, how many searches um, did your library systems generate? And you would add up the searches regular across all your platforms, and that would be the number to get. Okay, real quick, discuss counter compliance and what that means. We just have one slide on this, but to be counter compliant, all of these must be true. The content provider must offer all of the standard reports that apply to their platform. They must provide access to the reports through an online interface. So in other words, it should be easy for a librarian, library staff to log in and, and, and access the reports. They must provide access to reports in XML format via Sushi. Got to have a Sushi server. And every year they must pass an audit by an auditor that has been approved by counter. So if you fail on any one of those, you have to resolve the issue or be removed from counter compliant. And you must apply, you must comply with all of those to say that you are counter compliant. Um, and just as an aside, if you run across any vendors that say we are count, we are um, we have counter like reports or indicate that they have reports that are counter compliant, but they don't actually show up in the list. Those should be reported to the folks at counter. You can actually do that through the use of site if you want as well, such that we can chase things down and, and resolve the issue with. Them. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, sushi. So sushi um, as you can imagine, can be of tremendous value if it's set up correctly. And so that's what we're going to look at. So we've already seen this diagram. And the uh, actual sushi standard, though, is really about this part in the middle. It's really about providing the, the, the protocol, as it were, to allow the client and the server to talk um, and, and exchange messages. And so you need a client. So to put it another way, Sushi is an enabler, not a complete solution. You can't go to the NISO site, access the Sushi pages, download Sushi and start harvesting usage. You have to have a client to do that. And the next couple of slides, we'll look at a few of the options. So first option is commercial applications. So most ERM systems, most ERM vendors are going to offer some form of uh, usage handling with their workflow. And as part of that, a Sushi client is usually built in. So you know, if, you've, if you've got an ERM or a workflow system, um, from you know, one of the ILS vendors, the chances are you have access to Sushi, and it's just a matter of, of, of um, configuring them and getting the configuration right. And, and here's some examples here. Um, I, I believe the Ex Libris and ProQuest options um, are getting sort of folded into Alma going forward, but they exist today and a lot of people use them. It's, you know, EBSCO has a product, innovative interfaces, I'm sure. Uh, Sushi Dynamics and others have them as well. On the other side, if you if you don't have a commercial product or can't afford a commercial product, um, there's the open source option. So a couple of cautions on that. One is open source is often provided as is, and it may have some limitations. Um, some clients, you know, such as the MISO one, um, will help you harvest the usage, but they don't do anything else with it. So basically, it is a way to get, um, in some cases, a uh, XML file deposited automatically on your 
desktop, but now you have to do something with it. Um, some of these were built as proof of concept, so they don't really aren't necessarily fully functional. Um, they may lack some of the analysis capability, but they can be a starting point if you're interested in, in building your own system. So some examples are, are MISO, uh, which was a client built a number of years ago by ProQuest um, and made open access, and that's been used Lot, particularly the consortium. There's Pi Counter Soap UI, Soap UI is a free tool. It's actually a um, web service testing tool, but you can actually configure it and get it harvesting uh, kind of reports fairly easily using Sushi. Coral, uh, which is the open X, open source rather, uh, ERM system, has a usage statistics module. And this is sort of the one, or maybe there's more, but it's the one main uh, open source application that is more of a fully flushed out application. So it's kind of kind of cool. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a couple of slides. But some basics for configuring Sushi. So Sushi, you know, you need to know how it works and you need to, um, get the configuration right. So, you know, quite simply, when the Sushi client requests a report, it needs to know where the server is because you got to get the, get, get the report. Um, so very much like, um, as Steve was explaining with the, the open URL, uh, when you configure um, open URL at the content provider site, you need to know where your server is. So this is kind of the reverse. You need to know for each platform where the server can be found. Um, and you need to tell that server who's asking, which the software that's asking, so it can know that there's, it's got permission, who, what organization you want usage for, what report do you want, and what date ranges. So if we take our, our little um, um, diagram here, the URL, See, that's really the target where we're pointing to. Um, and if we expand a sushi request, uh, there are some things. Um, there is what's called a requester ID. Who is making the request? The customer ID. What libraries usage do you want? What institutions usage do you want? Um, the report name. What report do you want? And what are the begin and end dates for the usage that you want to return? And that's really the really it. Um, for most configurations, that's what you need to know. But getting that information not, is not necessarily um, straightforward. So you typically go to a content provider site and um, you, know, you, right, you log into EBSCO admin for EBSCO host, and you may have to actually activate Sushi um, and then it'll give you the, the details and how you do it varies by platform. But the one thing I can say, if you're looking at a screen um, that's, that's in an ERM, for example, for the Sushi credentials, and if you feel you have to guess on what to put in a field for like a URL or request or ID or custom ID, um, there's a pretty probably a 100% chance it's not going to work. So if you have to guess, go back to the provider and ask more questions because otherwise it's, it's bound to fail. But let's take a quick look. So if you go into um, EBSCO admin, for example, and there's a reports and statistics option, there's a counter um, R4 reports and in there, Sushi authentication and That's where you can find the details that you need to fill out in your, your ERM. And we'll show that in, in uh, Coral in just a minute is where you put that in. Now, there's lots of content providers out there and there's a lot of, of, of um, admin models we need to find out and, and rules are different. So within the Project Counter website, there's, there's a Registry of Compliant Vendors. And here's the URL. Um, 
And when you get there, you can actually dig in for a given vendor and look at the sushi data. And there's some key information here. Um, there's, there's instructions of what to do to activate it. Uh, this is the URL you would need to, to get things running. Um, information about what you need to supply for requester ID and, and customer ID. So it, it's a little painstaking to go through for each of your content providers, but it's typically a one-time effort. And once it's set up, then you benefit from being able to automatically harvest the reports. So let's take a, a quick walk through. Um, and we're going to look at the uh, Coral ERM's usage statistics module. And I just pulled these together using the free demo. So it's there, uh, this URL here is will get you started. And you can do similar things on your own. So anyway, I went into Coral and um, in Coral, you th there's a place where you manage your providers. In this case, it's EBSCOhost and there's a tab here for Sushi. And you can see it's asking for that information we need. What's the service URL? What's the release number for? Would, um, again, the reports, you can put however many reports you want, JR1, comma, DB1, that sort of thing. The requester ID and the customer ID. And just for those who are saving this PowerPoint, those are not real, they will not work. Um, just, just a heads up. Um, and what day do I want? usage harvested on. So the one thing to remember is counter gives a content provider up to four weeks after the end of the month to sort out their usage data. So if you start automatically trying to pull down usage on the first of the next month, first of the month, um, it's going to fail for four weeks before it actually gets usage. So it's good to know and this instructs the automatic harvesting as to when to start. Now on this screen, you can see here, it says connection test successful. You can actually click a, a link there and it'll verify that you got everything right. So assuming you got everything right, um, under the Sushi tab, um, you get this sort of administrative screen. And the lower part is, it's talking about all Sushi services. Now, this would be a list of everything you've configured. Now, I just went in and configured the one, um, but it tells you what reports, when the next run is scheduled, when the last run happened, um, and the latest status, but it's also a run now link. So if I click on the run now, it will give me a pop-up. I can say, here's the date range I want, and here's the report I want, and it will automatically um, go ahead and, and, and run the report. And then the top part of the screen, we see reports that have been already run. So you know, we had the, the run now option, but on top of the report, here's what's been run and this, this view to process. So this report's been loaded, it's sort of staged and ready to get dropped into the reporting service. So if I click on that, I'm going to see something like this. Um, and this is the database report, and you see the list of databases and um, the usage counts. They only pulled in two months worth of usage. And if you scroll down, there's a lot more rows in this for in reality. But at the bottom, you have the option to confirm. You click confirm, and that usage data then will wind up in your in in the uh, Coral re reporting service, and you can run the various reports that they offer. So I'm not going to get into that here, something for y'all to experiment if you want, but I just wanted to do the walkthroughs. That's the kind of exercise you do to set this up. Now, EBSCOhost was set up in this one, and every month the system will automatically go and retrieve that usage. So that um, is a tour of release four. Um, now I want to look ahead Kind of release five is in development. Uh, the current status is that a draft code of practice has been created and it is now available for public comments and feedback is being accepted. So the target for this to go into effect is 2019. So you see the 2019 date here. So let's take a quick look 
and what we're doing with release five. So, you know, why a new release? So the previous codes of practice, they evolved over the years. I remember I said in, in counter release four uh, was actually combined book release books code of practice and the journal and databases code of practice. And so there were some variations in how those two um, codes of practice approached reports. Plus reports were being added to, and metrics to add, address specific needs. We added mobile reports and goal open access report, these sorts of things. So the resulting code of practice is somewhat complex and it has a lot of inconsistencies. Plus, needs continue to change and code practice needs to change as well to keep up. So the objective we had, one of the objectives was to have release five provide a, a balance between these changing reporting needs and the need to make things simpler so that all content providers can achieve compliance and that librarians have these consistent comparable and credible user statistics. So the themes for release five were consistency, simplicity, flexibility, and clarity. Consistency in the form of consistent report layouts, consistency between formats, i.e. Sushi and Excel should convey the same information, and they don't necessarily do that today. Um, and consistency in vocabulary. Simplicity by reducing the number of reports and metrics. Introduce attributes so metric types don't have to be overloaded or nuanced based on the report they appear in and have standard reports that meet the most common reporting needs. So the, the, the hope is that you run, all librarians would be able to run a journal title report one and use it for the same purposes. Flexibility is being added by introducing expanded or, or flexible reports that introduce the notion of features and filters rather, and other reporting options to allow librarians looking for a deeper analysis in the usage to get at that information without having to have counter create special one-off reports. And I'll have an example of that in a few minutes. Um, so also a lot of work is going into the glossary, the processing rules, the implementation guides, and to add clarity to the code of practice so we can avoid uh, incompatible and inconsistent implementations. So here's a list of reports that we're looking at. Um, and they're broken down, you can see on the right, uh, platform, database, title, and item level reports. Each of those categories has a uh, expanded report. And the idea about these expanded reports is those are the ones where um, the librarian can go in there and can, can filter and select and, and add options to create more of the report that they want. And then the other reports, or the standard reports, would meet the, the, shall we see, the most common reporting needs. So by doing this, by current count, we took the 36 reports in release four and that's been reduced to 11 reports in release five. And all the optional reports are being replaced and the same data can be accessed or as needed in the expanded reports. So release five simplifies metric types, but it also adds some attributes. So, one of the issues with release four is we had a, situations where the same metric meant something different in different reports. So if you look at journal report one or journal report 1A, um, gold open access or mobile, um, 
they all look pretty much the same, um, but they're really counting full text downloads in different contexts. And so if, other than the report name, um, if you didn't know the name of the report, you're just looking at the data, uh, you couldn't tell what they were counting. And the same with book report one and two, we already talked about. So you strip headers from these reports, you basically have usage statistics that are problematic because you can't really tell what's being counted and what they mean. So with release five, we supplemented the uh, metric types with additional attributes. Um, and so like, like a data type, would indicate if something is a book or a journal. Section type indicates if the item accessed was an article or a chapter. So if the data type was a book, the section type would be a chapter. Access type um, lets us know if this content being accessed was paid for by license fees, controlled access, or gold open access. Access method separates regular usage from text and data mining usage. Year of publication, self-explanatory. Um, and um, so all of these describe sort of the, the nature of the activity. So if we were to look at a hypothetical report, we could have these columns. And for the first journal, we've got um, total item requests of 124, and these are for content that was open access gold, gold open access. We have another row that indicates 231 total item requests access type controlled, which is the things that basically were paid for by subscription. So you have more granularity in the reporting um, that allows you to get more easily get at the information you want and in the same report without having to run multiple reports. So I'm not going to go over to all the details on this one, but here on the left, we have release four um, metric types, and there were 25. And that's been cut virtually in half with release five, which can only have 12. And they're grouped into item level metrics, database and platform level metrics. So it's Digging a little bit deeper on these ones, I'll try not to spend too much time on this, but we're introducing some new vocabulary here. Um, so we're measuring more things nowadays than books and journals. We're measuring audio, we're measuring video usage and these sorts of things. And so those are not full text. So using the term full text was misleading. So we've gone a little bit more generic, and now we're talking about investigations and requests. Investigations are really, it's a superset metric. Any activity about an item, you click an open URL link, you click to get the full text, you go view the uh, abstract page, um, you, you link to the ILL form or whatever, those are all investigations. Activity on an item, that really are an expression of interest on behalf of the user. And then we're breaking them into sort of three, three, shall we say groups. The total item investigations, that really counts the number of times the thing was clicked on. Um, the unique item investigation, so let's say the item was an article or book chapter. Well, that book can only have one unique item investigation in a user session. So if the user sits there clicking back and forth through the table of contents, re-looking at the same article several times, that would count, that activity would show up in the total item investigations, but they would only get credit for one in the unique item investigations. The unique title, that is about um, giving the title, as in the book in most cases, credit for only one of these activities in a user session. So this helps um, address that problem where one content provider delivers the title as one PDF, and you might have one abstract that you're looking at, and the other content provider delivers the 
the, the, a, a similar title as by chapter. You may have 25 chapters and you may have 25 metadata records for the 25 chapters. So this allows that to be rolled up to at the, uh, at the title. At the title. Requests, this is really, this is about full text of an article. We're actually retrieving the full text of a chapter of a book or requesting the full content of a video or the content of a video or, or um, an image or, or what have you. So it's a subset of investigations. Um, and it is really those where you actually got the content. Same three breakdowns. You have the total items requested. So this is really all the activity clicking around in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a for, for articles and books. Uh, unique item requests, which means you, that a given article or chapter can only take credit for one of those per session. And the unique title requests, again, geared at books, which means a, a book can only be credited, credited with one unique title request in a given session. All right, searches. Um, not much change of searches. Um, the only thing we really did do, a couple of things, we uh, split up federated and automated into two metric types. Um, so federated search engines, um, they're broadcasting their search from afar, for example. So there's one set of behavior. And discovery services, where you are having your discovery services search a bunch of databases that are loaded locally, um, those searches are, are, are automated. So we've, we've separated them out um, just for, for better um, metrics. Searches platform is um, it's a new term. It's really the same as regular searches reported at the platform level. We just changed the wording on that um, to remove ambiguity. So searches, the user clicks a search on the platform, on EBSCOhost, on ProQuest, or whatever. That each time they do that, that's a searches platform search. And then we've got the uh, the uh, access denied category, which is you don't have a license for the content or you've exceeded your simultaneous use. And those are really the same as with release four. Um, data types, again, what's the nature of the content being accessed? Was it a book? Was it a journal? Was it multimedia? Was it a database? That sort of thing. Section types. So if the thing was a book, for example, was a chunk I was looking at, do they access a chapter? Do they access the whole book? Do they access a session? section, article. Um, access types here, we're just tracking, you know, was this content controlled? Did you need a subscription to get at it? Uh, was it open access, delayed open access, uh, meaning you got it as part of your subscription, but there was a 12 month embargo period. And then after that embargo period, it's available open access to everyone. Was it Gold open access, which would apply to things that are hybrid or other free to read. Um, separating usage out from regular usage and text and data mining usage. And this is this access method attribute for that. So the issue with text and data mining is that um, if you have somebody in your sort of your information or computer science group doing text and data mining and they go in to a publisher site, they may download masses of amounts of data to, to look at later and do whatever analysis they do. And that can really cause issues with collection development statistics. If all of a sudden every article from every journal from that publisher was accessed in a month, um, the numbers just go through the roof. So this allows those things to be, to be reported separately. Um, your publication, self-explanatory, um, but it's separate. It's, it's reported as a separate attribute that you can optionally show on a report, and that gives you far more flexibility than Journal Report 5 did. Okay, let's take a quick look at the report formats. Um, here's Release 4 format reports, and we've got uh, journal report one and database report one. 
And if you look at database report one, you see there's a column called user activity, and it breaks it out by metric type. But the journal and book reports don't really do that. They, you just assume to know what those totals mean. Um, in the uh, journal report, there's this PDF and HTML that are broken out separately as totals in the Excel spreadsheet version, but they're broken out by month in the um, sushi version. So when we looked at um, release five, and here's a, an example of a report that's being proposed. Just, so don't, this may change, but this is, this is the idea. There's a consistent header. So we labeled every field in column A and put the values in B. So every report will have the identical or very similar headers. The column labels in A are gonna be all the same. Obviously the values in, the, in column B are different. Um, it means if you've got something written to process these reports, um, all the reports are the same. Uh, the Sushi version of these reports will use these same labels and have the same data elements included. So there's consistency not only between reports, but also between delivery mechanisms for those reports. Um, the details in the report are consistent. So we've, we've got from one report to the next, we're gonna use the same term, uh, metric type, for example, um, DOI, obvious ones are there as well. But also those same terms will be used in the Sushi version and the spreadsheet version. And vocabulary is another area. So again, if you look at the metric types that are listed, if you've experimented with release four, um, the, what shows, for example, in database report one, the names of the metric types are very different than the metric types in the uh, XML. So it creates a confusion and extra work. So we're, we're, we're looking for consistency there. Um, okay, let's take a quick look at the expanded reports and how they might be implemented. Now, I'll go through this quick case, just to lose some time for questions. Um, so here we've got a mock-up of, of what this expanded report interface might look like. Um, Counter is not dictating what a content provider implements. We're just making suggestions of the kind of flexibility that is needed. But in this mock-up, we can specify usage states, metric types, data types, access types, access methods, year of publication, that sort of thing. And you can indicate here whether or not you include a column that elements as a column on the report. In other words, do you want the usage broken out by that or not? If, you, if not, then it's just summarized. So here's an example. We're looking at usage for the first two months of this year um, that pertains to journals, um, turnaways that were because there was no license. Um, we don't care what the access type was. We only want regular usage. And let's limit it to 2000. 13 through 2015, and please include the year of publication as column. Right? So when we submit that, you're going to get something that looks similar to this. Um, and this is kind of a mock-up. Um, but if we dig into the detail, you will see that um, you know there's multiple rows per title, and there's the metrics are broken out by year of publication. So if you are using this to dig deeper into content you might want to renew or make a renewal decision on, you could just um, you know, click on cell A14, do a filter, um, and search for American history, and then bring up the four rows there, and then use the numbers to make a decision. Or it's pretty easy with Excel and uh, Google Sheets to create a, what's called a pivot table that would look something like this, where you have one row per title, and then you've got columns for each of the years. So you can kind of quickly see, well, for example, American history was used 
a lot in 2013 and 14. Um, and yeah, I mean a lot, three times. Um, this is all from a demo account. So don't, don't make any judgments on any um, publications because of this, but, but you get the idea. You can see, see the usage and if a current subscription would really help you or not. Okay, so the other question that comes up a lot when we talk about this is with the new metric types, um, how do they compare with what I reported on? You're giving me all new stuff. And how am I going to report, put things in my reports um, comparing them to what I did with my release four metrics? So for journals, uh, you reported on full text totals typically. And the total item requests is the same metric. It's the same things being counted. Um, if in um, if you were a library in release four that used the PDF counts um, for your cost per use analysis because you felt the numbers were being inflated because of HTML always showing, then you would use unique item requests as your count. Um, and that's actually a more accurate view because it, it also counts those HTML articles that were accessed and used and the user didn't bother to pull up the full text, PDF of the full text. For books, um, unique title requests replaces the full text total. It's really the same metric for book report one. Plus, um, you can also get that same level of metric from books that would otherwise only show up in book report two. So that means that you've got a consistent metric across all platforms, which is really cool. But if you wanted to look at the detailed totals in book report two, which basically shows you the number of chapter downloads and so forth, then total item requests would be what you use for that. And then you can put in the section type to add more clarity. On the database side, um, if you've moved to result clicks and or record views, the total items investigate total item investigations, that's your replacement. What's new is for your full text databases, you should also be able to get total item requests and unique item requests as well to give you an idea of the full text usage from that database. Um, search is regular, really the same as regular searches. Platform side of things, the uh, searches platform is the same with regular searches that you'll see. Um, Relabeling was done for clarity so it doesn't get confused with the sum of the regular searches from the databases. Um, unique item requests, unique title requests, those are new. So you can actually get platform level totals of either the items or articles accessed or the, in the case of books, the the books access. So if you have to fill out those total information for surveys, it may be a lot easier because you, you won't have to go into several places. So on the sushi front, um, sushi continues to be an important code component of the code of practice. Um, in release five, the next version of sushi will be supported. And that next version is one which adopts sort of a RESTful interface returning JSON formatted usage. Um, the URL would resemble more like an open URL, uh, not in style, in that it is a URL rather than, a, than what it contains. But this is in line with modern web development. It uses approaches that are familiar to most web developers. It also will allow um, sort of a microservice approach and the ability to use filters, the ability to ask for usage for a single journal, for example, would allow you to embed usage display in an application that doesn't otherwise capture counter. Um, the beauty of using uh, some of these newer technologies and approaches is there's freely available tools that allow you to do stuff like this. So the, the uh, image on the right is an automatically generated online interactive documentation. Um, plus, there's tools that will automatically generate uh, client and server code in many, many different languages. 
so that you can, uh, it gives you a start on implementation. So the goal is to make this much easier to, uh, to, to do. Um, so this is the methods that are being proposed. I won't go into details here on those. Happy to answer any questions or, uh, by email if anybody is interested. Um, consortia reports. So supporting consortia needs uh, for using was first introduced in uh, release four. And release five, we're looking to improve on that. So the issues with release four, these reports can be massive and so big, in fact, that they're impossible to actually create the report um, or in some cases it's impossible to actually consume the report. Um, they're only available as XML. In many cases, the actual consortium reports are. And that means that data needs to be manipulated, it needs to be converted. Complex reports, reports from some reports. So with release five, we're taking a, a different approach, approaching the problem in a different way. So content providers um, will be required in the Sushi implementation to support what's called a members API call. So if you're a consortia, you add the content provider, EBSCO host or ProQuest or whatever. So give me my list of members and it will return the list of your members and the Sushi credentials for each of those members. You can then ask for any report for those members by just walking through the list of members and getting, getting the reports. Now, Counter realizes that for some consortia, um, that level of development would be problematic. So they've committed to creating or having developed an open source uh, solution that would effectively give a consortia administrator a one-click option to go to a content provider, pull in all the usage for all the members, and then output it in whatever the preferred format is, whether you want an Excel sheet, one sheet per, um, per member, whether you want a massive single report with everything all tacked on end to end, or, or what have you. And the, uh, the, the goal is to provide consortia with a more more, much more consistent access to the usage of their members, um, but also to reduce the what would be otherwise very expensive and complex development to attempt to replicate the massive reports um, that consortia have. So, so that's where we're going with that. Um, other areas, continuous maintenance, just touch on this really quickly. Um, codes of practice, continue to evolve and they will continue to evolve. And so the release five will include procedures on how to uh, make changes to the code of practice um, in an orderly way, proper approvals, proper um, implementation timeframes and these sorts of things so that we um, don't have to wait five years for the next code or something. Release five. Uh, Here's the timeline. Uh, we're currently in the consult check discuss um, period. Um, next April to June timeframe is taking that feedback, making any revisions that are necessary. The goal of publishing in July, and then content providers will have 18 months to implement before things go live. January of 2018. So we want to hear from you. Um, here's a link. The PowerPoints will be available after uh, the, the session. Um, and Or you can just search for, find this on the news article on the uses site. The link here to the Code of Practice. Please read it if you have a time. If you're interested, please comment. Surveys. Need the feedback. Uh, need the feedback to be, um, make it do what you all need it to do. So, 
Um, that's really it for me. I think we may have time for a few questions, although I'm not quite sure how that'll work, but, um, <laughs> but we are, so thank you very much. Yeah, so let's give Oliver Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for Oliver for giving this very comprehensive uh, information. And it's maybe a little bit too overwhelming for us to digest, but uh, we have time, right? So if you have questions, please come to this, you know, to the microphone and ask Oliver, please. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, of course uh, we will load the you know the uh, PowerPoint and also the video recordings on our website. So you can always go to the ERM, which stands for <laughs> Electronics and Metadata Resources uh, Best Practice, and you can find our task force website under CEO uh, website. So always go there, and also you can submit your questions and then have all of his contact information there. Okay, thank you very much. And let's give Olive uh, another, you know, uh, applause. <laughs> and finally, I want to, yes, thank you, Oliver. Can you hear me? Th yes, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. So. Yes. So um, finally, I want to give a round of thanks uh, first, to uh, actually to Hannah, Hannah Kim of our East Asian Library colleagues here, and also to Junior, who actually helps coordinate all the technical survey, technical support for this workshop. And then I want to thank uh, our task force members, which actually uh, has been led by Bi Hua, Bi Hua Ma from UC uh, San Diego, but she uh, unfortunately, I uh, was not able to come because of her uh, family situation. And then other task force members include Charlene, Charlene Zhong, and uh, Ben Shi from UCSD, and uh, also for, uh, Susan, <coughs> Susan Xue from uh, UC Berkeley. And I want to specifically thank uh, Erica. Okay, she was here a moment ago. Oh, yeah. Erica, and also <laughs> Connie and Meg all the way from Hong Kong here to do the registration. And also um, other members such as Lawrence from uh, 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 Emory University and then Song Hu from uh, UC LA and also Chen Zhi Wang from uh, Columbia. So um, the task force uh, has been you know, collaborating, calling uh, help from our members and on several projects. And in the past year, the task force finished uh, several collaborative uh, cataloging projects on Chinese electronic journals. And uh, uh, I think now another uh, major focus of collaboration is on uh, research collaboration project on NISO, uh, 13 NISO uh, practice, uh, best practice or standards related to electronic resources. So um, including what we have covered today for the workshop, the open URL, the counter and the sushi, you know, uh, best practice code of conduct. And then uh, 18 members, CEO members participate in this collaboration project with Chinese uh, library colleagues. So we're, we hope to call more members to participate in this project, and also we hope to expand the project to uh, including our Japanese studies uh, colleagues and also Korean uh, studies uh, librarians to you know, to promote the uh, code of conduct and best practice for all East Asian uh, electronic resources so that this is for the benefit of our whole community, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, everyone, that was a long session, but um, thank you for um, being patient and um, very being very attentive to the sessions. I just wanted to make a quick announcement that we have more tea and drinks back there. 
And also we're having a break up until three o'clock and then we'll be starting OCLC CJK user group session. <laughs>